Oh, and we start again. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Bismillah. Um, if it's the last 10 days, then it'd be the 21st night, isn't it? So tonight would be an odd night, isn't it? I believe. Have you got the GoFundMe link? Um... The clocks go forward tomorrow. The last Sunday of um... the last Sunday of um... March. I think, if I'm not wrong. Okay, let's um, pin some links. Yeah, my um, so horse come early today, mashallah. So I'm going to eat before reading today. Uh, today's sahur is um potato cakes with uh, laughing cow and uh, scrambled eggs uh, beautifully prepared by my daughter mashallah she get some water also come Wow, like I'm from Malaysia. You want to watch a video while I'm eating? A 
I put that video on from yesterday for a little bit. Um, what was you watching yesterday? Who was we watching yesterday? Oh, I want to continue that one. Oh, there he is. Just while I'm finishing up my food. Ask, can I, can I, can I um, examine the body? So when the body came, okay. he studied it. Okay. And his conclusion was, this man died from drowning. Yeah, when he when he studied, you know, the, the, these autopsy, he says this mummy, this this Egyptian pharaoh, yeah. died from drowning. So we have a mummy here now of a pharaoh, okay. yeah, who died from drowning, yeah, which is supposed to be the mummy from the time of Moses, yeah, okay. Ramesses the second. Yeah. Okay, so when. He made this this utterance. His colleague said, I wouldn't let the Muslims hear you say that. And he says, well, why not? It goes because their claim is that the body of Pharaoh was preserved. Okay. Whereas the Bible claim is it was lost. If you declare that this body would die from drowning, you'll back them up in what they claim. Yeah. Now the amazing thing about this body, this mummy, do you know where it's exhibited? Alexandria. Alexandria is the most visited tourist destination in the world. And this body doesn't just stay there. It tours museums. And Allah says in the Quran about this mummy, about this pharaoh, we shall make him an example for all mankind so it just happens that he's in the most exhibited exhibited in the most uh, visited the tourist destination in the world right and yeah he's exhibited around the world okay. so Morris Bukai was shocked by this this scientist this Christian scientist so what he did he went to Syria and for three years he studied Arabic and he learned the Quranic Arabic so he didn't have to rely on translation that he could read the Quran in its language yeah and what he did as a scientist he went through the Quran and anything that resembled science he would remove it so whether we're speaking about um, where the oceans meet the seas, he was talking about how uh, clouds form rain, he was talking about how the mountains are pegged into the earth, he was talking about the embryology and the fetus forming in the womb and all of these things. He would remove it from the Quran, that chapter. Yeah? Then when he'd done that, he would test each fact with what he had to hand to test whether or not these scientific facts were indeed true. A slight, discla slight disclaimer at this point. Um, this was uh, from a while back in Speaker's Corner, where some of the terminology used was incorrect by me. Um, these are not scientific facts in the Quran. They are things that elude to the natural world that we can uh, contemplate upon. So rather than saying they're scientific facts, they're more like signs. The more like indicators to make you question why would somebody who authored this book bring up such things make such claims and they're things that are tangible <clears throat> so i always say to atheists tell me something that the quran says that you can demonstrate isn't true and of course they can't so that's just a slight disclaimer here this was a while back my terminology was a little bit off or not and this was his conclusion he says i as a man of science have removed the science what i found in the quran and science in the quran is not just in one chapter it's throughout it. Z. and i've tested what the quran had claims and every single scientific fact that i've tried to test turns out to be true again not facts
the way it's described, right? Then he went on to say, no, not only is science in the Quran, A to Z, but heaven and hell fire is in the Quran, A to Z. And then he said, and I as a man of science cannot disprove the science in the Quran. Who am I to try to challenge heaven and hell fire? in the Qur'an. And then he said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, and he became a Muslim. Right? Why? Because he knew that no man in the 7th century, not just known, could write about science and get accurate from 7th century to now. Because that's not how science works. See, the way science works is this, man has a theory, he has an idea about something, but he can't test that theory yet until he gets the right instruments to test that theory. So as we move on in history, they get the ability to test that theory and see if it's right or not. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's a mistake, sometimes it needs tweaking. This is why the theory of evolution has changed so many times now. This is why we're on multiverse now, from Charles Darwin. Right? Because they realize we were wrong and they change it here, there and everywhere. Okay. So science by nature is transitory. Yet the science of the Quran is as it was then, as it is now. And it's still accurate. So we have to question, how does a man in the 7th century not only know historical things he could have never known, yeah? And at the same time, have all this scientific understanding in a time when he never had it. Yeah? And it's proof that the Quran was meant to be read by you today. Yeah? Because the prophet isn't here today. Yeah, the, the miracle of the Arabic is not really going to be influenced you today. But what should influence you today is the science. And because we're in 21st century, now if you said to a man in the 14th, in the 7th century, look what the Quran says. It says the, uh, the, the, the moon reflects the sun. Right. Yeah, or it says, look what the Quran says. It says, when the baby forms in the womb and the stages of pregnancy and the leech like, and yeah. Now, when the baby forms in the womb, yeah, it's visible to the naked eye. Yeah, you can't see the shape of the embryo with the naked eye. Okay, <laughs> the Quran describes the shape of the embryo. Yeah, before the invention of the electromagnetic microscope. Up until the end of the 19th century, science of Europe believed that either the sperm contained a mini embryo or the egg contained a mini embryo. But the Quran had already explained the exact process. Now, how did it do that? No man in the 7th century herding goats could do that. Impossible. So if, if man in the desert 1400 years ago couldn't do this, and you've already accepted the devil didn't do this, then who did? There's only one alternative. What I'm saying to you. And as Sherlock Holmes says, when you eliminate the impossible, whatever's left, no matter how improbable, has to be the truth. And at that moment, we shall stop it because <clears throat> I've eaten and we can start reading very soon. Okay, just to answer Sharp's question, um, the reason we don't say scientific facts in the Quran, um, the whole, the term scientific facts is, is wrong in the first place because in science there are no facts, standard. So even with, within the philosophy of science, there are no such thing as facts. There are just best explanations today. So there's nothing... Um, there's no such thing as scientific facts. This is the first thing. Second thing, once you use science as a standard to measure the Quran by, then what happens is you, um, you, if science changes or whatever, and the Quran doesn't agree with the new understanding in science, then the Quran would seem to be incorrect if you've made science your standard. So it's the other way around. The Quran is a standard of truth. Science is the the gr gr grasping at straws yeah science is giving you um the best natural explanation but it discounts an, a supernatural explanation so we we the quran is the standard the quran is a criterion as it calls it itself a criterion of truth so and according to the philosophy of science um Science could be the, the science of today could be refuted by the science of tomorrow based upon new evidence or new data so you can only give the best explanation today based upon the data you have to, to hand, if you like. So uh, an atheist who believes in science as if that's his um, tool to seek out truth, his own philosophy tells him he can't even be sure what he believes today to be true is actually true because tomorrow it could be refuted. 
So this is a philosophy of science. So we as Muslims, the last thing we should be doing then is taking this weak philosophy of science, which itself declares cannot establish truth and use it as a tool to establish truth. Does that answer your question, Mr. Sharp? If Sharp's content with my response, I continue reading. Ah, makes sense. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. So we don't we don't put so much weight. What we do say is uh, the Quran is not a book of science, but it's a book of signs. It's something that you can um, reflect upon, contemplate on. And as Allah says in the Quran, men of understanding, sitting, standing, lying down, reflecting upon these verses, questioning. Why would it, why would it, like going back to the call, why would it talk about the embryo and, you know, stages of pregnancy and all of these things when no one in the 6th century could be sure or 7th century could be sure what actually is the case? No, there's no join in the chat at the moment. Maybe afterwards we'll see how I'm feeling. Probably not. But we're going to, we're going to read in a minute. Let's just see how we're doing with the go fan me. Right. Just a quick one. Um, so today's GoFundMe is the one for the masjid. Um, I'm going to have to make a video for this because it's, it's really struggling. This particular GoFundMe. This is a for, this is this is for a masjid. This is to go towards a, a wudu area for the masjid, mashallah, um, of, a, of my brand new masjid. This is my masjid, so you'll be supporting the masjid that I pray in. This is my my center. And inshallah, I'm trying to raise hundred thousand pound for the masjid. I'm trying to raise ten thousand pound of it to help. Um, we're up to seven hundred pound, mashallah, of a ten thousand pound target. We need we need to get a wriggle on to get this moving. This is a month of mercy. This is a month of Ramadan. Four or four, it finishes today. I'm um, uh, We need we need to get a wriggle on. We need we need to um, get this sorted out. This is a, a proper, proper sadaqa jariya, mashallah. This is, you know, every time someone has wudu to make salah, you're getting rewards for that salah. Imagine how many people are going to pray in that masjid in the month of Ramadan. Not just the month of Ramadan, throughout the year. And, we're, and this center has uh, facilities for sisters, mashallah. So facilities and our mothers and daughters and sisters, inshallah, to uh, have a place where they can um, do their ibadah as well as organize things amongst the community and things like that. So this center is it's not just a masjid. It's a community center. It's everything included, mashallah. Um, and like I said, this is for the wudu area. So we're trying to raise ten thousand pound. We should be able to raise ten thousand pound. I don't see why it was a problem. Like I said, one thousand people giving a tenner. That's all we need. So um, it's in the it's in the chat uh, pinned, I believe. Did it? Yeah, I pinned it. Mashallah. So like I said, one thousand people, ten pound each. Target hit. Don't think you have to give a thousand pound or a hundred pound. Just one thousand people, ten pound each job done actually it's now 930 people 930 people 10 pound each we can do this I, I don't i don't know what the problem is realistically we've got mashallah for this channel 355,000 subscribers and we just need 930 people to give a tenner for a masjid mashallah that's going to be benefit for them for their sadaqa jariya you know what i'm saying 10 pound i don't know alhamdulillah we'll see but uh, we're on £700 right now. Um, let's see how we do it. I know it's always Ramadan, always trying to raise money for a mosque somewhere. Everyone's got their own local mosques. I do understand that. But I'm just asking you to help uh, my centre out, inshallah. Um, into, um, I like to say this opportunity for the wudu area. I mean, that's that's a key area. It's not just like the salah area. It's the wudu area. So the reward of the... Um, having the wudu and mashallah making the salah alhamdulillah anyway uh, without further ado let's get on with the reading and to just put something in perspective mashallah we um we raised um for our brother who was in a problem we raised nearly five thousand pound in two days um which is awesome for the brother mashallah imagine one brother was in was um, in a situation, mashallah, 
and we managed to raise him five thousand pounds in two days and for the masjid we've raised 700 pound in a week <laughs> think about it and jazakallah khair for everybody who supported the brother mashallah that really really helped him but um mashallah this is proper proper sadaqajaliya anyway <clears throat> We're on chapter 72. Chapter 72. I'm going to, after each chapter, I'm going to check the GoFundMe, man. It should be some increase. The months drew on until almost a year had passed since the signing of the Treaty of Hadabia. It was now time to set up for Mecca in accordance with the promise of Quraysh and the Prophet and his companions should have safe access to the holy precinct in order to perform the rite of the lesser pilgrimage. There were about 2,000 pilgrims in all, including the would-be pilgrims of the previous year, except for a few who had died or been killed in battle. Amongst those who had not been at Hadabia was Abu Huraira, a man of the Bani Daus. He had arrived in Medina with others of his tribe during the campaign of Khaybar, and being destitute, he had joined the people of the bench. On entering Islam, his name had been changed to Abd al-Rahman, but he was always known as Abu Huraira, the kitten man, literally the father of a kitten, because like the Prophet, he was very fond of cats and often had kittens to play with. He soon found favor with the Prophet, who on this occasion put him in charge of some of the sacrificed camels. When they heard that the pilgrims had reached the edge of the sacred territory, Quraysh vacated the whole of the hollow of Mecca and withdrew to the tops of the surrounding hills. The chiefs of Quraysh were gathered together on Mount Abu Qais, from which they could look down into the mosque. They also had a wide view of the surrounding country, and now they saw the pilgrims emerge in a long file from the northwestern pass, which leads down into the valley just below the city. Their ears caught an indistinct murmur, which quickly became distinguishable at the old, as the old pilgrims, old age old pilgrims cry, La Baik, Allahumma La Baik, here I am, O God, at thy service. The long procession of bareheaded, white robed men was led by the Prophet mounted on Kaswa with Abdullah ibn Rauha on foot, holding the bridle. Of the others, some were on camelback and some on foot. They made straight for the holy house by the nearest way. Each man was wearing his upper garment as a cloak, but at the entrance to the mosque, the Prophet adjusted his, passing it under his right arm, leaving the shoulder bare, and crossing two ends over the left shoulder so that they hung down back and front. The others followed his example. Still mounted, he rode to the southeast corner of the Kaaba and reverently touched the black stone with his staff. Then he made the seven circuits of the house, after which he withdrew to the foothill of the, the hill of Safa and passed to Fulvro, between it and the hill of Marwa, seven courses in all, ending at Marwa, to which many of the sacrificed animals had now been led. There he sacrificed a camel and his head was shaved by Kharash, who had done the same for him at Hudaybiyah. This completed the rite of the lesser pilgrimage. He then returned to the mosque, intending to enter the holy house, cluttered with idols though it was, but the doors were locked. And the key was with a member of the clan of Abu Addar. The Prophet sent a man to ask for it, but the chief of Quraysh replied that this was not in their agreement, the entry into the house not being part of the pilgrimage rite. So none of the Muslims entered it that year. But when the sun had reached its zenith, the Prophet told Bilal to go up onto the roof of the Kaaba and make the call to prayer. His resonant voice filled the whole valley of Mecca and floated up to the top of the hills, first with the magnifications, then with the two testimonies of Islam. I bear witness there is no God but God. I bear witness that the Muhammad is the messenger of God. From Abu Qubais, the chief of Quraysh could clearly, plainly distinguish Bilal, and they were outraged at the sight of the black slave on the roof of the holy house. But above all, they were conscious that this was a triumph for the enemy, which might have uncalculable repercussions, and they bitterly regretted having signed the treaty, which a year ago had seemed to be in their favor. The pilgrims spent three days in the evacuated city. The Prophet's tent was pitched to the mosque, during the nights, those of the Meccans who were Muslims in secret stole down from the hills and were many joyous encounters. Abbas, whose Islam was tolerated by the Quraysh, openly spent three of the days with the Prophet. It was then that he offered him in marriage his wife's sister, Maymunna, now a widow, and the Prophet accepted. Maymunna and Umm al-Fadl were full sisters, and with them living in the household of Abbas was her half-sister Salma, the widow of Hamza, and her daughter Umara. Ali suggested that their cousin Hamza's daughter should not be left amongst the idolaters, to which the Prophet and Abbas agreed, and since Fatima was one of the pilgrims, it was arranged, it was arranged that she should take Umara with her in her howdah. When the three days were at an end, Sahil and 
who waited came down from Abu Qubais and said to the Prophet who was sitting with Sa'ad ibn Ubaidah and others of the helpers, Thy time is finished, so be gone from us. The Prophet answered, How would it harm you to give me some respite that I may celebrate my marriage amongst you and prepare you for a feast? We need not thy feast, said, Be gone from us. We adjure thee by God, O Muhammad, and by the pact which is between us to leave our country. This was the third night which is now is past. Sa'ad, angry at their lack of courtesy, but the Prophet silenced him, saying, O oh, Sa'ad, no ill words to those who have come to visit us in our camp. Then he gave orders that by nightfall every pilgrim should have left the city. But he made an exception for his servant, Abu Rafi, whom he told to stay behind and bring Maimuna with him, which he did. And the marriage was cons consummated at Sa Sarif, a few miles outside the sacred precinct. This new alliance established another unforeseen relationship with the enemy. Maimuna and Um Al-Fadal and their half-sisters Salma and Asma were all daughters of the same mother. But Maimuna and Um Al-Fadal had another half-sister on their father's side by the name of Asma, widow of the great Walid of Maksum. If, she, if it, it was she who had borne him Khalid, who was, had now become the prophet's nephew by marriage. Wow. That's quite interesting. I never knew that. So Khalid bin Walid. He became the Prophet's nephew when he married Maimuna. Wow. This is this is an indication where people ask about why he had so many wives. You can see the wisdom in the marriages that he conducted, with it, whether it be widows or divorcees, mashallah. It was all about, a lot of it was to do with diplomacy. But at the same time, mashallah, he was marrying women who'd lost their husbands in battle, or he was marrying women, women who had been divorced. That's so magnanimous, mashallah. One day soon after the return to Medina, the Prophet was woken from an afternoon siesta by the sound of somewhat heated discussion. He recognized the voices of Ali, Zaid, and Jaffa, and it was evident that they were all three, all at three at odds with each other. It was also evident that the more they argued, the further they were reaching an agree the further they were from reaching an agreement. Opening the door of the room he was in, he called to them and asked what was the cause of their dispute. Don't worry, the Christians can have their moments. But they'll scatter. They'll scatter, you know, like when you lift up a rock and all the little creatures scatter. This is what they'll do. They exclaimed that it was a question of honour as to which of them had the most right to the guardian of Hamza's daughter, who had been in Ali's house ever since her arrival from Makkah. Come to me, said the prophet, and I will judge between you. When they were all seated, she turned first. he turned first to Ali and asked him what he had to say for himself. She is mine uncle's daughter, he said, and it was I who brought her out of from Mecca, and I have most right to her. The prophet then turned to Jaffa, who said, she is mine uncle's daughter and her mother's sister is in my house. My, his wife, Asma, was Omara's maternal aunt. As to Zaid, he simply said, she is my brother's daughter, for the Prophet had made the pact of brotherhood between Hamza and Zaid when they first came to Medina. And Hamza made a testament leaving Zaid in charge of his affairs. There was no doubt that each of the three was convinced that he had the best right to the honour in question. So before pronouncing his judgment, the Prophet spoke words of praise to each one of them. It was then that he said to Jaffa, thou art like me in looks and in character. Not until he saw that he had made each of them happy did his voice his decision, which was in favor of Jaffa. Thou hast most right to her, he said. The mother's sister is as as a mother. Jaffa said nothing but rose to his feet and circled around the prophet with steps of a dancer. Jaffa, what is this? said the prophet, he answered. It is that which I have seen the Abyssinians do in honor of their kings. If ever the Negus gave a man good reason to rejoice, that man would rise and dance about him. It was not long before the Prophet arranged a marriage between Omara and his own stepson, her cousin, Salma Salama, whose father, Abu al-Salama, was the son of Hamza's sister, Bara. On that occasion, the Prophet said, I have now required Salama enough. He meant that he was indebted to Salama for have given him his mother, Um Salama, in marriage. And now in return, he had given Salama a bride. The Prophet's entry into Mecca had been witnessed by the most eminent men of Quraysh. But there have been two notable exceptions. Khalid and Amr were not on Abu Qubais, were not on Abu Qubais's, or nor were they encamped in any of the other hills above Mecca. Both are withdrawn from the city well in advance of the Prophet's approach. Their decision to absent themselves had been made independently, nor were their reasons for doing so the same. 
But on one point, they were in complete agreement, namely that the Treaty of Hadabia had been a great moral victory for the Prophet and that his entry to Mecca would prove to be the end of their resistance to him. But the hostility of Amr against Islam had not diminished. Whereas Khalid had been for some years now a man who was in two minds. Outwardly, this had not been evident. His military prowess had thrust him to the fore in every action that Quraysh had taken against the Prophet. But he confessed afterwards that he had come away from Uhud and from the trench with the uneasy feeling that the battle had been pointless and that Muhammad would triumph in the end. And when the Prophet had eluded his squadron on the way to Hudaybiyah, Khalid had exclaimed, The man is inviolably protected. That has been his last action against that had been his last action against Islam. Then had come the amazing victory at Khaybar. But there was also considerations of a different kind. Almost despite himself, he had a personal liking for the Prophet. And from the letter that his younger brother Walid had written before his death, he had learned that the Prophet sometimes asked him after him, and that he had said that if he would put his redoubtable vigor on the side of Islam against the idolaters, it would be better for him, and we would give him preference over others. To this, Walid had added, So see, my brother. What thou hast missed. There was in addition even closer family influence at work. Khalid's mother Asma, who had been long favorable to the Prophet, had not recently entered Islam. And now his aunt Maymuna had become the Prophet's wife. Not long after this marriage, Khalid had a dream in which he was aware of being in a country, which was shut on all sides and extremely barren. Then he went from this confinement into a land which is green and fertile, with pastures which stretch far and wide. He knew that this was something of a vision. And having divined the essence of its meaning, he made up his mind to go to Medina. But he preferred to go with a companion. Was there no one else of like mind with him? Next to Amr, who was not to be found, his nearest comrades in arms were Ikrama and Safwan. He sounded both of them, but Safwan said, even if every other man of Quraysh were to follow Muhammad, I would never follow him. Ikrama said, Ikrama said much the same. Akhar remembered that both their fathers had been killed at Badr, where Safwan had lost a brother. Regretfully, he set out alone. But no sooner had he left his house and he fell in with Uthman, the son of Talha of Abd Ad-Dar. The man who years ago had gallantly escorted An Salama from Makkah to Medina. Uthman was a close friend to Khalid, closer than either Safwan or Ikrama. But Khalid's experience with the other two had made him recitant. And he remembers, and he remembered moreover that Uthman had lost his father, two uncles, and four brothers at Uhud. And they rode on together in silence for a while. Then Khalid suddenly decided to speak, and with a searching look, he said, Our plight is no better than that of a fox in his earth. Pour him but a pail of water, and out he must come. He immediately saw that Uthman understood perfectly what he meant. So he told him where he was going and why. And Uthman, who had been gradually coming to the same decision, now resolved to accompany him. Khalid gladly agreed to wait for him whilst he returned home for provisions and clothes. And early the next morning, the two of them set off together for Medina. As to Amr, he was of sound mind with Safwan and Ikrama about Islam, but he saw more clearly than they did the precariousness of the situation and gathered around him a few younger men, his clansmen of Sam and others who looked on him as a leader. He persuaded them to go with him to Abyssinia. He pointed out that if Muhammad triumphed in the inevitable imminent struggle for power, then they would have safe asylum. And if Quraysh would triumph, after all, they could return to Mecca. We'd rather be under the Negus than under Muhammad, he said, and they agreed. Amr was an astute politician and a man of great perseverance, not easily discouraged. Despite his total failure to undermine the powerful impression which Jaffa and his companions had made, he had nonetheless been at pains to appease the Negus as far as he was concerned. And had assiduously, 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 what does that mean? Assiduously. Are you guys listening or are you just having your own conversation? <laughs> but yeah, I think I need to switch off the chat while I'm reading. Assiduously. With great care and perseverance. Okay. Um So I'd always, assiduously, so with great, uh, okay, main, perseverance, maintain relations with him throughout the years, always avoiding any mention uh, of the Muslim refugees. But now they had left the country and gone to Medina, and with them they would have gone, they and with them would have gone, but now they had left the country and gone to Medina, 
and with them would have gone, so Amr wrongly concluded, all the needs is prejudice in favour of the new religion. At first his audience, his rich gift of leather was graciously accepted, and the Negus seemed so well disposed that Amr decided to come at once to the point and ask for asylum. But in doing so, he spoke slightly of the prophet, and this provoked a sudden overwhelming outburst of royal anger. Amr was altogether taken aback. From what the Negus said, it was clear that the best way for him to build a future for himself at his court, far better than gifts of leather, was to become a follower of Muhammad. He had fled from Islam only to find that Islam had outstripped him to the very refuge he had hoped to take. And with the ruin of his plans, his resistance began to crumble. Dost thou testify unto this, O king, he said, meaning to the prophethood of Muhammad? I bet bear witness to it before God, said the Negus. Do what I tell thee, O Amr, and follow him. This is the truth by God, and he will triumph over every persuasion that setteth itself against him, even as Moses triumphed over Pharaoh and his hosts. History has not recorded the names of the companions of Amr or what they decided to do, but Amr himself boarded a boat which took him to a port on the Yemeni coast, where he bought a camel and provisions and set off for the north. And when he reached Hadda, one of the first halts on the coastal route from Makkah to Medina, he came upon Khalid and Uthman, and they were traveling the rest of the way together. They were joyfully received in Medina, and Khalid said of the Prophet, his face shone with light as he returned, my greeting of peace. He was the first to pledge allegiance. I bear witness that there is no God but God, and thou art the messenger of God. Praise be to God who hath guided thee, said the Prophet. I have never saw in thee an intelligence which I hope would not bring thee in the end to anything but good. O messenger of God, said Khalid, thou didst all those fields of battle where I took part against thee in obstinate resistance to the truth. Pray therefore unto God that he may forgive them. Islam cut us away with all that went before, said the Prophet. Even so much as that, said Khalid, still visibly troubled in conscience, and the Prophet prayed, O God, forgive Khalid for all his obstructing of the way to thy path. Then Uthman and Amr pledged their allegiance, and Amr said afterwards that he had been quite unable to raise his eyes to the Prophet's face. Such was the reverence he felt for him at that moment. Umar's cousin Hisham, the brother of Amr, had escaped from Makkah to Medina shortly after the Battle of the Trench. Since then, he had been joined by his nephew Abdullah, the son of Amr, Abd Allah, now in his 16th year, was deeply devout and much given to fasting. He also showed promise of being one of the most learned of the companions and recorded many of the sayings of the Prophet who gave him permission to write them down both. Write them down. Both Abd Allah and Hisham had prayed for the Islam of Amr and his reunion with him in Medina was a matter of great rejoicing both for them and for him. Two other events of joy in these months were the Islam of Aqil, the brother of Jaffa, and Ali and of Jubair, the son of Muttim. The faith which had taken root in Jubair's heart when he had come to ransom some of the captives of Bada was now a growth which could not be set aside. To Aqil, when he came to pledge his allegiance, the Prophet said, I love thee with two loves, for thy near kinship unto me and for the love for which I never ever saw for thee in mine uncle. The earlier half of this same year of rejoicing, the eighth year after the Hijra, was also a time of bereavement. The first of the deaths in the household of the Prophet was that of his daughter Zainab. He was with her at the end and spoke words of comfort to his son-in-law and little granddaughter. Then he gave instructions to Umm Ayman together with Sauda and Umm Salama to make ready the body for burial. When the ablutions had been performed, the Prophet took off an undergarment he was wearing and told them to wrap her in it before they shrouded her. Then he fled funeral prayer and prayed also beside her grave. Khadija was only one of his wives who had borne him children. The people of Medina longed that a child should be born to the Prophet in their city. Only two of his present wives, Umm Salama and Umm Habiba, had borne children to their first husbands. But at each new marriage, the citizens were filled with fresh hopes, which gradually faded. For not one of the later wives was destined to be the mother of a child to the prophet. Yet now, shortly after the death of his eldest daughter, it appeared that he was again to become a father. Maria, the, his Coptic bondmaid, was expecting a child. She was already a centre of attention for the people of Medina, who knew well the prophet's affection for her, and who sought to please him by their kindness to her. And now their attentiveness was redoubled. Okay, mashallah. <clears throat> Let me just go to my brother Enyan's hard work and share with you. Let's bring the book to life now, mashallah. So we're going to bring now to life the uh, moment where Khalid and Amir uh, accepted Islam. One of my favorite parts is when Khalid bin Walid, bin Walid accepts Islam as well, mashallah. We'll do it from here as well. My fa I'll start with my favorite part. God, 
This is what we call hadith, mashallah. So this is how hadith are. So the companion of the Prophet sallallahu would narrate uh, a story of, of what occurred. So, yeah, and so and this. So when people say, oh, hadith are written down 100, 200 years later. No, they were spoken about in the time of the Prophet. This is how it was oral. And then they were collected together at the time of uh, Bukhari and such. But obviously you had Imam Malik who was already collecting. But anyway, so this is an actual hadith and how it would have happened. So the companion would talk about something the prophet did or said, and then subhanAllah. Just literally no. So this is this is what a hadith actually is. This is Amr listening now to uh, a narration of the Prophet. So. Himself above other men, he said. So I lay back and watched him. And, and that's Khalid. So Khalid and Amr now are listening and, and Islam is permeating with MashaAllah. That was the moment Khalid bin Walid accepted Islam. Um, uh, should we read on or should we leave it there? Um, should we read on? Or should we leave it the? What do you reckon? Hmm. We've only got a little bit to go now, mashallah. We've we've timed this beautifully. Was it hard an enemy? Yeah, of course he was. But he he listened and he heard the Quran and he's seen. Um, the people had they followed Muhammad so <clears throat> Okay, let's continue there. Chapter 73, Syria. About three months after his return from the lesser pilgrimage, the Prophet sent 15 men to act as peaceful messengers of Islam to one of the tribes on the borders of Syria. But their friendly greetings were met by a shower of arrows, and having been obliged to fight, they all, they were all killed but one. This, there was another setback, smaller in that, that involved only a single death, but of a greater political important, import. A messenger to Bostra was intercepted by a chief of the tribe of Ghassan and put to death. Such an act could not be allowed to go unpunished, despite the risk that the Ghassanids, who, who were mainly Christians, might be able to persuade Caesar's representative to send them help. The Prophet mustered an army of 3,000 men and put Zaid in command of them, with instructions that if Zaid should be killed, Jaffa should take his place. Abd Allah Abd Rawah was named as third in order of precedence. If these three should be incapacitated, the men were to follow a commander of their own choosing. The Prophet then gave Zaid a white standard, and with other of his companions, he accompanied the army to where the grounds rise up towards the pass of farewell, an opening between the hills a little to the north of Uhud. Abdullah had with him on the back of his saddle an orphan boy, whose guardian he was. On the way, the boy heard him recite his verses he had composed, expressing the desire to be left behind in Syria when the army returned home. When I heard these verses, I wept, said the boy, and he flicked me with his whip and said, What harm to thee, wretched fellow, if God grant me martyrdom and I have rest from this world and its toil and its cares and its sorrows and its accidents, and thou returnest safe in the saddle. After that, during a halt in the night, he prayed two prayer cycles, followed by a long supplication. Then he called me and I said, Here I am at thy service. If God will, he said, it is martyrdom. When the army reached the Syrian border, they heard that not only had the northern tribes come out in considerable strength, but that Caesar's representative had greatly reinforced them with imperial troops. <coughs> Altogether, the enemy was said to be 100,000 strong, allowing for, oh, wow. allowing for the probability of gross exaggeration. Zaid nonetheless decided to halt and to hold council of war. Most of the men were in favor of sending immediately to inform the prophet of this great turn, grave turn of events. Then he could either order them home or give them auxiliaries. But Abdullah spoke vigorously against any such course, using the same unanswerable argument which had been used before Uhud and which was to be used again and again in the future. He ended his speech with the words, we have before us a certainty of one, two good things, either victory or martyrdom. To join our brethren and be their companions in the gardens of paradise, on then to the attack. Abdullah's resolution prevailed and the army continued its northward advance. They were now not far from the southern end of the Dead Sea, separated from its long and deep valley by the range of hills which rise up from its eastern shores. A few hours' march brought them within sight of the enemy. Whatever the exact numbers of the combined Arab and Byzantine forces, the Muslims could see at a glance that they themselves were vastly outnumbered, on a scale which they had never yet experienced. 
nor had any of them witnessed before such military splendor as that of the imperial squadrons, which formed the center of the host, with the Arabs on either flank. The pomp of Quraysh as they had descended the hill of Akamal at Badr had been as nothing to the wealth of arms and armor at the richly comparisoned horses, which now met their eyes. Their approach, moreover, had been anticipated, and the legions were ready for them, drawn up in battle formation. Wishing to avoid an immediate engagement, for the slope of the land was against them, Zayb gave orders to withdraw southwards towards Mutta, where they could take, to have the advantage and where they consolidated their position. The enemy, conscious of the greatest, great superiority of their numbers and bent on making an altogether decisive day, followed them to Mutta. As they drew near, instead of retreating further as they had expected, Zayd gave the order to attack. At the moment, the space between Mutta and Medina was folded for the Prophet. <clears throat> At that moment, the space between Mutta and Medina was folded up for the Prophet, and he saw Zayd with the white standard leading his men to battle. He saw him many times mortally wounded until finally he fell to the ground. And Jaffa took the standard and fought until his life was also flowed from his wounds. Then Abdullah took the standard and the attack which he led against the enemy was repulsed with a vigorous onslaught in which he too was killed and his men driven back in disarray. Another helper, Thabit ibn Arkham, seized the standard and the Muslims rallied, whereupon he gave it to Khalid, who at first refused the honor, saying that Thabit had more right to it. Take it, man, said Thabit. I did but take, I take it to give it to thee. So Khalid took command and knit the ranks together. And the enemy advance was so firmly checked that they drew back enough to enable the Muslims to beat an orderly retreat. It was a victory for the other side, but they gained no advantage from it. And of the Muslims, apart from their three leaders, only five were killed. It was thus something of a victory for Khalid. And when the Prophet told his companions of the battle and the deaths of Zayd and Jaffa and Abdullah, he said, then one of God's swords took the standard and God opened up the way for them. That is for the Muslims to reach safety. And thus it was that Khalid came to be called the sword of God. As the Prophet described the battle, the tears were flowing down his cheeks. And when the time came for prayer, he led it immediately, withdrew from the mosque instead of turning to face the congregation as he was wont. He did the same again at sunset and yet again after the night prayer. Meantime, he had been to the house of Jaffa. Oh, Asma, he said, bring me Jaffa's sons. With some misgivings at the gravity of his face, she fetched the three boys. The Prophet kissed them and then again his eyes filled with tears and he wept. Oh, messenger of God, she said, dearer than my father and my mother, what maketh thee weep? Have news reached thee of Jaffa and his companions? Even so, he said. They were struck down this day. She uttered a cry of lamentation and women hastened to her side. The prophet returned to his house and ordered food to be prepared for the family of Jaffa during the next days. Their grief doth busy them, he said, beyond caring for their own needs. Um Ayman and Osama and the rest of Zayd's family were in his house. He had already condole, condoled with them and he returned Zayd's little daughter, came into the street in tears. Seeing him, she ran into his arms. He now wept unrestrainably, and he clasped the child to him. His body shook with sobs. Sad ibn Ubaidah happened to pass by at that moment, and searching in himself for words of comfort, he murmured, O messenger of God, what is this? This, said the prophet, is one who loveth yearning for his beloved. That night the prophet had a vision of paradise, and he saw that Zaid was there, and Jaffa and Abdullah, and the other martyrs of the battle. And he saw Jaffa flying with wings like an angel. At dawn he sent to the... He went to the mosque. His companions sensed that the weight of his sorrow had left him. And after the prayer, he turned to usual to face the congregation. Then he went again to Asma to tell her of his vision, and she was greatly consoled. When Khalid and his men returned to Medina, the Prophet called for his white mule, Duldul, with, which, which the Mokaukis had given him. And putting Jaffa's eldest boy in front of him on the saddle, he rode out to meet them. Many men and women had already lined the route. And as the troops passed, they jeered at them and threw dust in their faces. Run away, they shouted. Did ye flee for, from fighting in God's path? Nay, said the prophet. They are not runaways, but return us again to the fight, if God will. The setback of Muta was an encouragement to the northern Arabs to strengthen their resistance to the new Islamic state. And in the following months came that the tribes of Bali and Quda were massing in considerable numbers on the Syrian border, with intent to march south. But this time there appeared to be no question of reinforcements from Caesar. The Prophet sent Amr at the head of 300 men with instructions to fight where necessary and to win allies where possible. The choice of commander may have been partly determined by the close ties of kinship which Amr had with the tribes in question, for his mother was a woman of Bali. By dint of night marches and relatively scheduled camps, he avoided attracting undue attention and reached the Syrian border in 10 days. Winter had set in early that year and accustomed to being so far north, the men of Makkah and Medina set about gathering firewood as soon as they had made their final halt. But Amr forbade the lightings of a single fire 
and grumbles were silenced with the words, Ye were ordered to hear me and obey me, therefore do so. Quickly realizing that the enemy were in great numbers than had been anticipated, greater numbers than had been anticipated, and that there was little hope for the moment of local assistance, he sent back a man of Johanna to the prophet asking for reinforcement, immediately dispatched with an additional 200 men. As one of the closest companions and one who were moreover had fought in every campaign, he expected to take precedence. But Amr insisted that the newcomers were merely an auxiliary force and that he himself was commander in chief. The Prophet had told Abu Abaida to see that there was perfect cooperation and no division between the two forces. So the older man gave way, saying to Amr, In case thou should disobey me, by God I will obey thee. When the Prophet heard of this, he invoked blessings upon Abu Ubaida. Amr now led his 500 men across the Syrian border, and as they advanced, the enemy dispersed. There was only one brief exchange of arrows. For the rest, it was a question of coming upon deserted camps whose very recent occupants had vanished, and in the absence of the hostile clans, friendly elements, individuals and groups ventured to manifest themselves. So Amma was able to claim in a letter to the Prophet that he had re-established the influence of Islam upon the Syrian frontier. That influence was now rapidly growing throughout the tribes on all sides of the Yathrib oasis. The reasons were not purely spiritual. The Prophet was now known as a dangerous and incalculable enemy and as a powerful, reliable and generous ally. By comparison, other alliances were beginning to seem less attractive and more hazardous. In many cases, the political and religious motives were inextricably connected. But there was also a factor, slow working yet powerful and profound, which had nothing whatsoever to do with the politics and which was also largely independent of the deliberate efforts made by the believers to spread the message of Islam. This was the remarkable serenity which characterized those who practiced the new religion, the Quran. The book of God's oneness was also the book of mercy and the book of paradise. The recitation of its verses combined with the teaching of the messenger imbued the believers with the certainty that they had within easy reach. That is, through the fulfillment of certain conditions well within their capacity. The eternal satisfaction of every possible desire, the resulting happiness was a criterion of faith. The prophet insisted, all is well with the faithful, whatever the circumstances. Meantime, in Syria itself, there had been an event which it seems had not yet come to the ears of the Prophet, though it was no doubt partially the cause of the success of Amr's campaign. At any rate, it could be said to explain why the hostile Arab tribes against whom he had marched had to, had to rely entirely on its own strength without any imperial reinforcements. Heracles had received the news of his army's final victory over the Persians and of the recapture of the Rud, which they had taken from Jerusalem. He was at that time in Homs, from which he had made a pilgrimage on foot to the holy city in thanks to God for the recovery of all that had been lost. One night while he was there, he had a dream of remarkable clarity from which he knew for certain that the years of Byzantine sovereignty over Syria and Palestine were numbered. The next morning, those who were with him were struck by the troubled expression on his face. And in answer to their questions, he said, in a vision of the night, I beheld the victorious kingdom of a circumcised man. Then he questioned them about circumcision as to who practiced it. His generals and the other officials who were present told him that only the Jews were circumcised and they were trying to persuade him to take action against the Jews. When in came a messenger from the governor of Ghassan, leading with him a Bedouin. This man or king, said the messenger, is from the Arabs, a folk of sheep and camels. He speaketh of a wonder that befalleth in his country, so bid tell him of thee of it. Heraclius told his interpreter to question him and he answered, a man hath appeared amongst us, and he alleges that he is a prophet. Some have followed, and some believed him. Others opposed him. There have been fights between them in many places. I left them even so. Heraclius then told his attendants to see if the man was circumcised or not. And when the answer came that he was circumcised, he said, This by God is the vision which I saw, not what ye say. Then he sent for his chief of police and told him to search the country for a man of the same tribe as the claimant to the prophethood. Now Abu Sufyan, the chief of Abu Shams, had been present in Makkah had not been present in Makkah at the time of the lesser pilgrimage of the Muslims from Medina, for he had taken advantage of the armistice to go with the other two merchants of Quraysh to Syria. It was in Gaza, where they happened to be trading, that the emperor's men found them, and there they were immediately taken to Jerusalem. As soon as they were ushered into the royal presence, they were asked which of them was nearest in kin to those who claimed to be a prophet. And Abu Sufyan replied that he was the nearest. Whereupon Heracles summoned him forward and sat in front of him, saying to the others, I will question him. And if he lieth, do ye confute him? When I asked the general questions about his Hashemite cousin, Abu Sufyan began to belittle him and said, Let him not cause thee any anxiety. His importance is less than thou hast heard it to be. 
but the emperor impatiently cut him short with more particular questions. And having received a precise answer on every point, he summed up his conclusion as follows. I asked thee about his lineage, and thou didst affirm that it was pure and of the best amongst you. And God chooses no man for a prophet, save for him who is the noblest lineage. Then I asked it if any kinsman had made claims like of this, and thou said nay. Then I asked them if he had been disposed of sovereignty and had made this claim for the sake of recovering it. And again, thine answer was nay. Then I asked thee about his followers. And thou said they were the weak and the poor and young slaves and women and such have been followers of the prophet in all times. Then I asked if any of his followers left him and thou said none. Even so is the sweetness of faith. Once it hath entered the heart, it departed not away. Then I asked if he were treacherous and thou did answer nay. And verily, if what thou hast told me of be truth, he will vanquish me here where I now I stand, and I would I and would I were with him that I might wash his feet. Go ye now about your business. The prophet had written a letter to Heracles on the same lines as his letters to the rulers of Persia and Egypt, summoning him to Islam. This letter, which had been delivered by Dia al Kalbi to the governor of Bostra, was forwarded to Jerusalem soon after Abu Sufyan had, despite himself, convinced the emperor that the Arab claimant's prophethood was indeed a true prophet. The letter from Medina confirmed this. But for still further assurance, Heracles set down on paper all that he had learned, including an account of his vision, and sent it to a man of Constantinople, whose knowledge and judgment he relied on. And the man replied, he is the prophet whom we expect. There is no doubt of it. Therefore, follow him and believe in him. Meantime, Heracles had returned to Homs, and it was there that he received this answer. Having read it, he invited all the chief men of the Byzantines, who were in that city, to assemble in a room in his palace. And he gave orders that the doors should be locked. Then he himself addressed them for an upper chamber, saying, Romans, if success and right guidance be your aim, and if you would that your sovereignty remain firm, then pledge your allegiance to this prophet. They understood his words, for they knew of the prophet's letter. And as one man they turned and fled to the doors, which they tried in vain to open. Seeing their great aversion, Heracles despaired of making them believe as he believed. So he called them back and reassured them. I but said what I said, that I might test the strength of your faith, which now I have seen. And they prostrated themselves before him and were reconciled. He was nonetheless certain that Syria would inevitably be conquered by the followers of the prophet. But for the moment, he felt obliged to keep his convictions to himself. MashaAllah. Right. I think this is the part I just want to share just before we end the uh, this particular segment. Well, maybe the end of the show. We'll see. No, no, no. Not this part. Have we already seen that part? One second. Oh, where's the part up there? One second. Let me just drop back. A... Let me just stop the screen before I do anything stupid. All right. Um, let me just. Where was this part? Did my. Ah, there we go. Um, what the hell is that, Mr. Indian? <laughs> hmm. Oh, there it is. What a movie. Alhamdulillah. Yep, so that was, um, we brought the book again to life. And um, Vegan Gains is streaming me. Okay. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> All right. Why is he streaming me? Uh, what's he banging on about these days? I've seen him for ages. 
the profit uh, would be an event. Oh, okay, so it's that type of thing. Okay, it's... everybody say goodbye to vegan games. <laughs> oh dear, 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 dear. Um, uh, any God Logic fans here today, or Sam Shimon fans? Bang it on. Should we share? We share. Should we share? Uh, let's share a, a recent short. This is an evidence that our boy Avery cannot deal with Christianity. Oh, um, one second. One second. I hate sharing TikToks though, because they're like, one second. God, they look so terrible. I hate sharing TikTok. It's not even TikTok though, it's a bloody, just a short, isn't it? So why doesn't it share like as a short? Why is it like share like all mashed up? Anyway, um, let's just share. You're, you're designing, mate. You've already conceded that your authors of your gospels are anonymous, and yet you no, believe what they say. Yes, you did. I never conceded that. Yeah, at all. Yes, you, yes, you did. You said so. What? So were yours? Are the, are, are the authors of the gospels anonymous? No, or not. They're not. Who wrote the book of Mark? Yeah, we'll get into that. In a who's Mark? Mark did. No, who's Mark? So we'll, 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 we'll let you. We're not. No, who, who's, the, who's this writer, Mark? This is not Christianity you're defending, mate. You've already conceded that your authors of your gospels are anonymous, and yet you no, believe what they say. Yes, you did. I never conceded that yeah, at all. Yes, you, yes, you did. You said, so what? So were yours. Are the, are, are the authors of the Gospels Anonymous? No. Or not? They're not. Who wrote the book of Mark? Yeah, we'll get into that in a second. Who's Mark? Mark did. No, who's Mark? So we'll, 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 we'll let you. We're not no, who's, who's, who's this writer, Mark? This is not. This is, this is just an example. Um, <laughs> he actually said the authors of the Gospels were not anonymous. <laughs> it's like, what? Really? <laughs> oh. Imagine asking someone something that unrelated to the topic and then acting like they couldn't answer. Um, it was related to the topic because he was just discussing with a Muslim prior to me coming onto the stream. So anyway, Kingdom, did you did you see the conversation? If so, what was his initial claim? And what was my question at the end? And how did that um, impact on his claim? To see if you're paying attention. In fact, Kingdom, jump on, man. Jump on, tell us, tell us what you thought uh, Avery's point was and uh, how he demonstrated it. So tell us how you think, um, tell, tell me how you believe that Avery established his position. Um... The topic was, did Jesus mention Ahmed, not the gospel authors, right? Um, the topic was that, but prior to that, he was bullying a Muslim with this particular point. And he was f fudging his responses to the Muslim. Yeah. So when I first came on, that was my initial uh, contribution to try to defend the arguments the Muslim presented, even though they were a little bit um, kind of weak the way he was presenting them so that's the first thing second thing he said we get back to it we never got back to it um third thing just remind me remind me kingdom what was his claim oh sorry what was my final question to him and how do you how do you reconcile his response to his original claim uh oh so you do see that i was correct uh, no, <laughs> you posted a clip of an off topic question. No, it was a question. Whether it was off topic or not is irrelevant. He still couldn't answer it. We didn't we didn't return to it. Um anyway, um what was his claim? Come on, jump on, man. Don't don't no need to hide in the chat. You can come on the chat. You can tell me what point Avery was making and how he established his claim. Just just come and come and have a chat, man. I'll put the link here for you, son. Yeah, I won't buy. I just want to know 
what was the claim of Avery and how did he establish his claim? That's all. That's all. And, and, and let's see. Um, uh, so if I, I, the topic is Bible authorship and you say we'll get to that. Well, no, it means that if you was already in a discussion about this thing, then it's on the table, isn't it? If you if you're having a, for example, if you're doing a live stream about something and then you have a guest on and you're willing to talk about something else, that means you're willing to talk about something else in that live stream on that topic. Yeah. So I just wanted to clarify those particular points. Anyway, anyway, stop, stop uh, deflecting. Them. So tell me again, what was Avery's initial claim and how did he substantiate or support that claim. Yeah. Now vegan games is vegan games is gone. He won't be coming in the chat or on the live stream. We've we've discussed with him before. He's just a waste of time. Uh Well, he did have a lack of logic. Are you going to jump on or not? So my question again is, what point was a did Davery have and how did he substantiate that point because you must have watched the stream so what was his point and how did he uh, substantiate that point i'll tell you it's i mean it, it ain't rocket science it ain't rocket science okay so his his claim was this that the quran makes a false claim that jesus prophesies muhammad because he cannot find any evidence of jesus prophesizing muhammad yeah that was it that was that his claim so he rejects the claim of the Quran because he can't see he's never seen any evidence. Or should I repeat? He sorry, should I uh, let me reiterate that? Because he says there is no evidence of Jesus ever speaking about Muhammad, peace and blessing upon him. That was his claim. Agreed or not? Do you agree or not? Is, was, was that his claim, Kingdom? That the, the the Quran has a false claim in it about Jesus prophesizing Muhammad because he's seen no evidence, or there is no evidence of Jesus ever prophesizing Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. That was his claim. Yes or no? Yes, yes or no? Abdul Tahir, why are you going on about vegan games? Vegan games has gone. Who cares? Honestly. Where's Kingdom gone now? All right, Abdul Tahir, I'm signing. I'm going to time you out, mate, because you're completely irrelevant. Absolutely, completely irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, I already got the win on you. My original point was that you asked an unrelated off topic question. I'd like you couldn't answer. He couldn't answer. Uh, you admit it was off topic. You're cooked as usual. All right. Are you going to, oh, you know what? All right. Don't worry about it. We'll do it this way. It's just so much easier. Let's just get rid of you. All right. So this is the standard. So they, they come on, uh, they, they bleat about something, right? And I asked a very simple question. What was the claim Avery made and how did he substantiate that claim? That's all I asked. And oh, he's doing waffling on about this, waffling on about that. Oh, I got the win on you. Oh, you were off topic originally. No, relax, relax. I told you why I spoke about Mark, because he was speaking to a Muslim prior to that. So that that's 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 that done. Okay. Then I said to you, on topic, 
what was the claim Avery made in his live stream? What was his whole live stream about? Yeah. What was his claim and how did he substantiate that claim? That's it. That's it. What was his claim? How did he substantiate it? So his claim was um, the Quran makes a false claim because it says Jesus prophesied Muhammad and there's no evidence that Jesus ever prophesied Muhammad. Therefore, uh, he never did. That, that was his claim. That was in a nutshell. That shows his illogical nature. So to call himself God logic is irrational because that's illogical. Because absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Unless, unless you would expect to see evidence. Okay, so this is how it works. So has has he answered? Let me just uh, let me just find that one. Right. So this is. Let me just share this one a second. Right. The Quran says that Jesus spoke of Muhammad. You're saying to me that's false. Yes. Is absence of evidence evidence of absence? Not all the time. Is it a logical fallacy to dismiss something because the evidence is absent? Uh, not all the time. Right. So he's true. He's correct. So evidence of absence and absence of evidence and evidence of absence is a logical fallacy, but not all the time. He's correct. Not all the time. But when are those times? I would say. So when those times are, the, 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 the exception to the rule or the exception that proves the rule is when you expect to see evidence of it. So, for example, if somebody said, let's let's say you, you slept the whole day. You, 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 this is a weird kind of analogy, but let me just try it. Let me just try it. Um, you, let's say you, you slept the whole day. And the next day, someone said to you, you're never going to guess what. And you go, what, what happened? Do you know there was a T-Rex running through central London yesterday? And you're like, no way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a T-Rex in central London yesterday, knocking over cabs, eating people, everything. And you're like, Are you really? Yeah, yeah, honestly, this, this thing happened, right? And you're like, okay. Um... No, I don't believe you, mate. I, I, yeah, prove it. And you, what, what do you mean? Well, I, so, so this is a situation now where you would expect, you would expect to see evidence. You would expect to hear people talking about this thing. You would expect to see it on the news. You would expect to see this thing. Yeah. So this is when it's an exception. Okay. So absence of evidence and evidence of absence, unless we should expect to see something. So I'll give you another prime example. And this is a more Christian example. So according to the book of Matthew, after the crucifixion, brains, zombies came out, went into the towns and cities. So zombies came out of their graves. The saints of old emptied their tombs and went into the houses uh, of the city. OK, so this was a claim of the author of the Gospel of Matthew. The author of Go the author of the Gospel of Matthew is the only person who ever makes this claim. Right. And so we ask for evidence of this thing. Why do you believe this thing is true? Now, someone could turn around and say, well, absence of evidence, evidence of absence. Fine. But what we should expect to see is people talking about this event. Because first thing you need to remember, Matthew got his information from eyewitnesses to whatever occurred. So if someone's going to tell Matthew, oh, this is what happened at the crucifixion, I'm pretty sure someone will say, oh, by the way, Matthew, you won't believe what happened after the crucifixion. You wouldn't believe that. All the zombies, all these, but their bodies came out of the grounds, man. It's all the cities. We'd expect to hear this in history. We'd expect to hear the Romans talking about it. We'd, heck, we'd expect to hear uh, Flavius Josephus writing about it. People would talk about dead bodies rising from their graves and entering the towns and the cities. Yeah. They make such a big fuss about one man rising from the grave and they ignore all the saints rising from their graves. It's like, what? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You make all this fuss because Jesus, apparently, according to you guys, raised from the dead and yet apparently all the saints rose from the dead and went into the towns and cities so what's the big deal of one man when anyway so this is absence of evidence evidence of absence right so it's a logical fallacy to, to say such a thing so not all the time is when you should expect to see something okay now ironically according to god logic so he's trying to say because he's not seen it, there's no evidence for it. It didn't happen. This is his claim. Is there an exception? Let's see if there's an exception. Yeah. Well, actually, 
according to his scripture, Jesus said many things, many things that weren't written down and did many things that weren't written down. So it's even more, it's even more evidence against the idea of evidence being present. Yeah. So to say absence of evidence, evidence of absence, the evidence is in front of his face, in his scripture, that Jesus said and did things that weren't written down. <laughs> so if you're a Christian and you know Jesus said many things that weren't written down and that they would fill the books of the world or the world can contain the books would be written. Surely your defense cannot be. There's no evidence he said it. I mean, come on. <laughs> and you call yourself God logic. It's completely illogical. It's completely irrational. And it's completely unreasonable. And your Christians are like, yeah, well done, God logic. You, you cooked him. You cooked him. Because you're so stupid. You can't follow an argument. How many Christians have I asked this question to who commented on my video, on the videos, yeah? I asked the same question. What was my last question to Avery? It was a very, very simple question. Yeah? What? Yeah, that's what it's like. <sighs> anyway. Um, you didn't really miss much. Just the part about how illogical it is. So anyway, so I asked so many Christians as to what was my last question to him and how did he respond? And what was my last question to him was at the end of the Gospel of John, where it says Jesus did many and did many things that weren't written down. What does that actually mean? And, and, and Avery said, well, it means he said and did many things that weren't written down. OK, and you're rejecting Jesus saying this thing that you're rejecting because you can't find it written down. It's like, really? <laughs> so this is the point. When that video comes out with his original claim, with my last question of the whole, the whole thing, completely crushing his original claim. <sighs> it's so funny. It's so ironic. And I love I love the God Logic fans that come here. I love the Avery fans. Oh, Hamza got cooked. Hamza got smoked. But they can't they can't work out how and why. Did you get me? It's like if, if you thought he did such a good number on me, you should should recollect it quite easily. Oh. No, no, it's a logical fallacy to say just because I've not seen the evidence, that means it's not true. Well, that's it's not, a logical that's fallacy. That's that's it is what, saying. what you're saying. I, it I'm is what you're saying. I have because I haven't seen any evidence that that therefore it's it's false. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there is no evidence. But it's the same thing. There is no evidence, which means you've not seen it. It's the same thing. Not because I haven't seen it. There is no evidence. No, no, no. But well, the Quran is the evidence. The Quran is not an evidence. The Quran is the claim. No, the Quran is the evidence, mate. No, uh, no, the Quran is the evidence also. But if God is claiming it, then it's true, isn't it? Are you saying yeah. where the Quran... See, and, and they think this is not even circular reasoning because obviously we're not presupposing something. We're actually demonstrating why we believe the Quran is the word of Allah. I mean, this is another, obviously, conversation. But our premise, you can't come into our paradigm um, and then act like it's your paradigm. So if, that's another logical fallacy. You can't paradigm shift. So if you come into someone else's paradigm, so if you're speaking to Muslims and Muslims believe for example, that the Quran is the word of Allah, then this is an evidence for what, what, what it's saying is true. Okay, if you wanted to evidence the evidence, then you could ask why you believe the Quran is true, or we could give you our reasons as to why the Quran is true. If you want to challenge the reason why you believe the Quran is true, it's another conversation. But you cannot 
act like uh, your paradigm is correct and then try to import it onto us in, in your argumentation. If you want to argue with a Muslim, you have to go into their paradigm and deal with it from their paradigm perspective, not from the idea. So when we say the Quran is the evidence, it's because we believe the Quran is the word of Allah. And then, of course, what it says will be true because God tells the truth <laughs> and God would know. And so that's why that's our position. So, what, what, so we have justification and to say what we say based upon what we believe. So we believe that Jesus prophesied of Muhammad Sallallahu based upon what the Quran tells us. That's our evidence. OK, you want evidence. That's not our problem. Yeah. Quran is enough evidence for us. If you as a non-Muslim wants evidence. OK, unfortunately, you can't go scrubbing them around looking for the writings of Jesus because you're just not going to find them. Yeah. And you can't. And if you can't find what someone um, didn't bother to write down, then you're not going to find it either. Do you get me? Anyway, what was the other, what was the other one he did? Here's a problem you've got as a Christian. Because you have to verify every single individual book of your Bible. So you have to validate Gospels of Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, the Epistles, Acts, Revelation, all of this kind of stuff. All Epistles of James, Jude, and all of these things, because they're all different authors. So is this person reliable? Is this person reliable? Is this person reliable? So I understand your paradigm. But in Islam, we don't have this problem because we have one author, which is Allah. Yeah. So our paradigm, once we validate that author, whatever the book says is true. Standard. Here's a problem you've got as a Christian. Because you have to verify every single... What that guy just said. What was the hardest thing you had to change? Um, my life, everything. Leaving my girlfriend, leaving my daughters, leaving my business, cutting ties, with, not cutting ties with my family, but my family cutting ties with me, I would say. It was it was the basically the reset. It was a reset button. Hamza, just admit it, you lost the debate. I'm Muslim, by the way. Um, there was no debate. It was a discussion. And I won the debate discussion at the end with my final question. Did you watch the full thing, Sheikh White? <laughs> Did you watch the full thing or not? Let's... Uh... Let's test this theory. I hate it when someone says, I'm Muslim, by the way. <laughs> we don't care. I'm not interested in who you are saying what. Yeah. Uh, you watch the full debate. Okay. What was Avery's claim? Let's see how Sheikh White was paying attention. Let's see if White Shake White was paying attention. What was what was the uh, I tell you what, Shake White. I'll go put the link out for you, so you can jump on, and you can tell me how I lost the discussion, <laughs> debate. I should have done debate then. Debate. There you go. There you go. There's there's the link. Uh, I'll let you jump on, and you can tell me how I lost. I've been. I mean, I'm interested to know how I lost or what I lost. Yeah, I know fudger time. I know, I know. Let's see if Shake White's going to join first. Or I shall bid you all good night. I shall bid you all a fond farewell. Let's hear Shake White. I do, I know, I remember fudger, don't worry. Let's hear Shake White. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. I, I, I'm interested. Hamza doesn't know what his final question was. <laughs> Jump on Philippians. You can tell me. It's not for it's not for me to know what the final question was. It's for you to know what the final question was. So, Sheikh White, are you are you going to join us or Philippians? You can join. I don't mind. Either one of you. You can come and tell me um, what. Uh, 
Good evening, Hamza. My name is Anthony and I come from a Hispanic Christian raised household. My family members are Christian and Catholic with my uncle being a Christian fundamentalist. I began. Ooh, it's like a story. Uh, all right. So, Sheikh White, are you jumping on or what? Or Philippians? I don't. Uh, all right. Sheikh White, we're going to time you up for that ridiculous comment. Um, all right. You can still join the live, though. You just, you just timed out in the chat section for now. Um, just so you know, Christians, just so you understand, if you want to call me out in the chat, it's not a problem, but then I'm going to give you the link. And if you can't come on here and respond, then I'll time you out. And if you continue chirps in, in the chat without jumping on, then I'll just remove you from the chat. It's a very, very simple process. All right, Philippians, I'm going to time you up now as well. I'm giving you opportunity to jump on. Um, and if you're not going to jump on, then we should just time you out. And you don't get to chat. Yeah, tip top. You can join and say good evening while we're waiting. I began searching for a deeper connection with the Lord, and it's been a hard when my uncle tells me that the only way to the Father is Jesus. What is a way I can learn more about Islam and Allah? MashaAllah, that's a good good question. Have you read the Quran yet, Anthony? Hey, Rose with thorns. Yeah, it's, it's standard. It's standard. So anyway, uh, so Philippians, um, Kingdom and Shake White, uh, you're more than welcome uh, to jump on. And tell me uh, you have block on nobody. No, I don't have block on nobody. Uh, anyone can get on. Um, those people have been timed out in the chat, not off the uh, live stream, not off the backstage. No, no, Shake White is five minute timeout. So you just can't message. So if you're timed out, you just can't message, but you can come onto the chat. I want to buy my Quran and I began to start praying at least one time a day by bowing down toward facing towards Mecca. But Minkle tells me what am I worship that I'm worshiping a worshiping a false god. Okay, Anthony Villabolos. Look, all I say to you, Anthony, is stay tuned. Not today, but we, we can have a conversation, no problem. I don't know why they don't click the link. Just tell me why I'm wrong. Look, if I if I'm wrong, if if I was defeated, just tell me the point I was defeated on. I'm not going to question you about your Bible. Don't worry. I'm not going to start asking you why you believe the Bible is your reliable source of information and all that stuff. I'm not going to pin you to the wall. I just want to know why you believe I lost the debate because I'm, I'm intrigued as to why um, so many of you believe that it wasn't even a debate, but why I lost the discussion. People have been telling me Sam destroyed you in that debate. <laughs> Sam wasn't even in it. Uh, this is that guy again. Uh, I'm sure we've had this guy before. I'm pretty sure this guy's the agnostic, isn't it? I can't be bothered with the diagnostics. Uh, yes, Gems. Hello. Yeah, mate. Hello. Yeah, mate. Okay. Um. Uh, I actually have many questions, but maybe one uh, I wanted to ask is: uh, How do you define that, uh, prophet? Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, uh, told the truth. 
What's the alternative? Um, what if he lied, for example? Uh, what, so you believe he lied? Why would he lie? Uh, I I want to explore the option. I'm not saying he was lying. I want to. Ex uh, I've lie. got a whole I've got a whole live stream on my channel about whether he was lying or not. Just go watch it. Uh, I have watched it. So you've watched it. So why are you asking me the question? Uh, I want to explore the idea. So give me one example of something that was said on that live stream that you want to uh, counter. Um, I think there might be a case where when he received his uh, first revelation, it might be explained why he was scared. No, no. What you you had you seen a whole video, a live stream uh, challenging the idea of him being a liar. What did you hear? that challenged him being a liar that you wish to refuse? Um, uh, about he, him being sane or staying sane and still seeing uh, things. Say that again, sorry. Uh, him seeing things but still staying sane. What are you on about? Um, that he might have seen some things but uh as a mental condition but it didn't get worse okay you, you you're th thinking about the wrong live stream okay we had two live streams one was was he crazy and one was was he lying yeah, yeah? who which one did you watch uh the one where he was lying i think if i remember correctly right so why are you talking about mental health um because i think they are uh, compatible in this specific case so you believe a mentally ill person does doesn't believe they're telling the truth? Uh, mentally ill is uh, kind of not, not the word, but I think you can have still hallucinations which you think are very real. But right. is that lying or telling the truth? Telling the truth, but right. also li also lying is. Well, well um, no, the lying is when you know what you're saying isn't true. Uh, let me explain this. Um, uh, I need to phrase my words. Um, I want to explore the idea that uh, most of the time he was lying, but there was a seed of truth. I'll tell you what to do, James. Go watch the stream again. Tell me something that Sharif said that you wish to counter. Okay? Tell me the timestamp. I'll, I'll put it on the screen. We'll watch what Sharif says, and then you can give me your counter to it. Okay? Sure. All right. Speak to you again. <laughs> uh, the link clearly works. Shake White's gone now. Don't worry about that. And Khida is also about to go. So Khida's gone as well. Uh, this is this is the problem. This is the problem. Look, if you want to come on here and say and challenge the Prophet Sassan saying that you think he was lying, then you need to refute what Sharif said. If you can't, just Exactly. You can't speak about lying and then bring up mental health and then because, look, it's very, very simple. A mentally ill person believes what they're saying is true. A person is hallucinating, believes what they're seeing is true. OK, a liar is pretending and making up that they've seen something or heard something or such. So a liar is intentional. A liar is deliberate. A liar knows what they're saying isn't true, but they're trying to make it. So it is. If you want to challenge mental health, challenge mental health. If you want to challenge the idea that the Prophet Muhammad has deliberately deceived people, then then you can uh, challenge that. Gems, don't worry about today. It's not going to happen today. Maybe tomorrow. Be coherent, though. If you're going to come on here, man, be coherent. Flip it now. Make a point. Make it succinct. Oh, yeah. How are we doing with the, the donations for the masjid? Ashallah, we've raised £135 today. Allahu Akbar. Jazakallah khair for everybody who supported. At least we've moved on. Alhamdulillah. At least we're not, we're not stuck on 700 uh, Inshallah, I'm going to do a, a little short video clip, I think, for that particular project with the link. Um, but Alhamdulillah. Gems seem to have a point. <laughs> oh, dear, dear, dear. Uh, could you explain the moon splitting? Uh, yes, the moon split. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Are the Sam Stan still here? I don't know. I don't know. They won't be in the chat because I've uh, I've blocked in the chat um, Shake White, so you won't see him commenting. I've blocked in the chat Hida, so you won't see him commenting. So. Um, Nav, we did a whole stream on was the Prophet Sam lying, a whole stream. And we challenged people to come on after it to, to, to counter anything that Sharif had said. And it was crickets, mate. It was tumbleweed. It was... It's not like a flipping cat. Anyway, you get, you get, the, you get the script. Silence, mate. Silence. Do a video at the masjid. That's that's very good idea, actually. Very good idea, Big Ash. I think I might do that. I might go to the wudu area. I do a video talking about it. Inshallah. Yeah, that's a very good idea. I might do that on Sunday. Yeah, maybe Sunday I'll do that. I can show the building work and this, that, the other. What does a Muslim wolf say? Awoo the Billah. <laughs> we'll have a chat until the Villa Bol Villa Lobos, don't worry. I've done it to Kath many times, Ambry. Many times I've done it to Kath at that masjid. Rose with thorns just exposed her nationality with her. Aou Zubilla. It's Aou Zubilla. She's not Arab. We know Rose with thorns is not an Arab, and she's got. We know she's got sub Indian continent uh, influence. Okay, we'll call it a day now. I'm gonna go pray for you, mashallah. Jazakallah khair for those who donated to the masjid. Uh, uh, there is a link, uh, Anthony, but it's not gonna be today now, son. Uh, we can have a chat uh, tomorrow if you like, no problem. I watched the video nine minutes thirty, where motives are listed for reasons of lying. Missed one crucial motive. Okay. You can jump on tomorrow, uh, Lepro Satberi. No, uh, my parents are from northern Pakistan. No, I know, I know, it's not a secret. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. So, we went, <laughs> so your parents will be a uh, Sangaye rather than a uh, Keso. Is that right? So, your, your parents will be Yoldwa Dres Alopinzu rather than Ikto Teen Japanch. Or is it a mixture? From what I understand, north, northern Pakistan is like Pash Peshawar area. It's they speak Pashto, huh? Instead of uh, Idara, it's uh, Rasha. Am, am I right or am I wrong? Any days in after this? Ah, oh, my, I'm a cheeky little fence build. Got me any nails? I uh, look forward to receiving that, Leith. You're from the northern area, Patan. Ah, so you're a Yoldwa Dresselo Pinzu. 
Okay, near Kashmir, the Jhelum district. So yes, a mix of Punjabi and Pashto. Ah, so okay, da. <laughs> Ramadan Barak Newcastle. I will even Kawasaki. He asked, Why, I even, I will even away the tune. <laughs> oh, King Supper saying. If you're confident, then you be taking on all naysayers. Don't be a wimp and put responses on timeout because you've been butchered by truth you can't dispute. Okay, let me explain the logic. <laughs> okay. If you chirps in the chat, you get invited to come onto the into this backstage and onto the stream to tell us exactly in word, your own words what the problem is why it was wrong what it was wrong about if you ignore that invitation and you continue chips in like you've not been invited then you'll be timed out okay um and i'm the irony is this i'll do it for you <laughs> here's the link tell me what i've been butchered on scow Honestly, seriously, you know, you, you, you lift up the rock, like I said earlier, you lift up the rock and all the creatures scatter, scatter, you see little wriggly worms going this way and wood lice going that way and some kind of thing with, I don't know, you've never seen before running another way with all the little kind of mini ones of them running with them. You know, you know when you pick up a rock and it's like all sorts of creepy crawlies underneath it and like you, you close your eyes for like five seconds and look up and everything's gone. Have you ever done that? You know, you pick up a rock and you see all these all these things and you literally you could look away like this. And you look back down and they've all gone. They've all found holes to go in and other places to go and other rocks to hide. And uh, have you ever done that? This is these guys. <laughs> literally, they're, you can hear them from under the rock all scurrying about. Right. You lift the rock. Yeah. And it's like scatter. <laughs> And they've gone this way, gone that way, wiggling this way and squirming that way and crawling another way. This is literally what they're like. This is this is the uh, this is the analogy as what they're like. <laughs> literally, scatter. Just come and speak. Come and tell us. Make it plain. Put it in lights. Given the opportunity. Do you know? They better not help you. What are you about? I don't know who King Super is. You gonna jump on King Super? I'm gonna. Uh, I tell you, I'm gonna go play my fudger. I'm gonna come back. If you're still here, if you're if you're here, then we I can bring you on. All right? Okay.
block of slime is correct. Stop this taunting. Okay. Calling people out is not a problem, but name calling is not needed. Yeah. Uh, King Super, you've been timed out, and the reason it's timed out is I don't know why you don't understand. Is that the link is there for you? Join the stream to make your point. Oh, one second. Please read the Bible if you believe Jesus is if you believe Jesus is God. I just finished reading the Bible. Clear that Jesus and God are two separate beings. Exactly, James. James, why are you still here? James, why are you still here? Uh, I wanted to explore the motives. What? Uh, more about the video you told me where nine thirty. Uh, there's a point which. Uh, presentation which gives motive for being a prophet and okay. I think it's missing one very crucial one what's it missing uh, he wanted to be a, a prophet himself why uh, maybe he was impressed of the previous prophets like Jesus and, Where did and he, he wanted to be remembered as, remembered How did you know about as one himself okay so, so he wanted what he wanted uh, wanted what uh, Fame after life. He wanted fame. A after what? life. He wanted an afterlife. No, he wanted fame as being remembered, like for prophets previous uh, be before him. And what gives I, I think, you that? And what gives you that impression that he had that kind of motive? I think it's very logical one, and I can personally uh, relate to it. To me, what about his, what, what about his character indicates that he wanted fame? Uh Famous being remembered. Uh, for no, example, no. He, his his name is in the first chapter of uh, Quran. No, but and what give what would give him the motive of fame? Uh, he wanted to be remembered as previous prophets. Okay, and what brings you to this conclusion? He wanted to be remembered as previous prophets. Uh, because his name is uh, spoken all the no, time. No, no, no. That's 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 <laughs> why did he want to be? Not how did uh, he, how has he demonstrated it? People, be, people have strange moments. I'm not interested and... in people. I'm interested in people. I'm interested in him specifically, in his lifetime, in his life story. What gave you the impression that he wanted to be famous? Uh, he he told me, told other others to uh, re remember him as a prophet. No, but you're missing the point. Not how did he fulfill it? Why did he want it? What gives you the impression that he was a man who wanted fame? I mean, there are people who want strange things. I'm interested in people. I'm interested in le him. legacy. Lego is one thing. I'm but, interested uh, in him. Other, I'm, I'm I, interested in him. That what gives the impression in his character that would indicate that he was a man who wanted fame. Uh, he wa uh, He seemed very respected, and uh, he proved that one. What? Uh, he seemed very. He was very respected. Uh, he and... was very respected. Yes. So how is that a motive for him wanting fame? Uh, I, I think it's it's a good option. No, I'm interested in what you think and your opinion. I'm about, I want facts here. I want to know what of his character give you the indication he wanted fame. Uh, the thing that uh, he is remembered. Oh, shut up. I can't be bothered. All right. I'm not asking that question. Stop answering the question. I'm not asking you. No, I mean... If if you ask for a you lawyer, what what you keep it? telling you keep telling me he wanted to be remembered, and I'm asking you what in his character indicates that he wants to be remembered. You've come to uh, this conclusion. Er everything which led to him being men mentioned uh, in every prayer. All right, you know what, James, I'm no disrespect, bro. You can't comprehend a basic question. You can't answer a direct question. It's just pointless. Have a lovely. Uh, may I? I... <sighs> I don't want if books and maybes, I want absolutes, you know what I mean? It's just a very, very simple question, man. In his character, 
I'll give you an example. Um, why why would Joseph Smith lie? Or well, Joseph Smith was a con man. <laughs> he did things for personal benefit. He was a known con man. You see, his character was a man who lies and dis is deceit dece deceitful. Uh, I think Leprobat is gems, <laughs> to be honest. I think he's the same person because his same poor English is in his chat that is in his uh, speech. It's the same guy. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's the same guy. I think. I think Lippo is gems. I don't know why people can't come and articulate their point succinctly. I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. Just be, just come with a precise point. And just by saying, for example, uh, Jem saying, oh, Muhammad, peace and peace, wanted fame, that still doesn't demonstrate how he could lie. There wasn't the only reason against it. Sheldon is, I don't know, gaslighting me, I believe. If they uh, can formulate things, yeah. Remember Ryan? <laughs> Remember Ryan? Think Kung Supa. Think of Ryan. Yeah. Think of Shake White. Think of Ryan. Just think of Ryan. Christians, don't be a Ryan. Yeah, Ryan talking to himself. Is... Uh, my debate with Sam Shimon may not happen. We, we shall see. And to be honest with you, it's going to be more... Uh, um, yeah, 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 I suppose. I don't know how tag team works, though, in debate. It's a bit weird. I don't know. Exactly, Amberine. Just say no to drugs, kids. We Americans say bro, the Brits say brav. No, we don't say brav, we say bro. <laughs> Road men say brav. All right, I'm going to give it three more minutes and then I'm going to go. Got a few fences to build and then. Okay, mashallah. Yeah, the clear Quran is an easy to read Quran, mashallah. Serious question. Do you think a debate is worth it? Because we know the Christians uh, won't change their stance. It's, yeah, but there's two aspects here. First, there may be genuine Christians who may. But I, I think more importantly is Muslims know how to respond to this nonsense. The only problem is the nonsense doesn't end. That's the only thing. You, you'd you have to debate them on every single point. And it's like, pfft. it's probably better, to be honest with you. And this is what me and John was discussing. It's probably better just taking their videos and responding to them. Taking each point or stupid claim they make and just taking them apart that way. Because I'm not going to keep having debate after debate after debate on each individual misconception. I'm just, just not going to do it. I just... Just exhaust, it'd be exhausting 
So I'm thinking it might be a better way. Just just react to their nonsense. Just do what uh, Farid responds did to Christian Prince and just take each one of their arguments and just obliterate them straight up. And then that's that uh, situation of Muslims learning how to respond to this nonsense is dealt with. Do you get me? Rather than um, just debating them, giving them fame and leverage and making them relevant. Do you get me? Do you get me? So get me about flipping ten times, about three sentences. This is this is this is what I'm thinking. Rather than um, giving them relevance, I don't like to give these people relevance, to be honest. Um, you who guess who have you observed your cubicle members trying hard to patch up your wounds? Okay, you're honored by a timeout. Okay, this should really excite you. <laughs> you who I'll make you famous. Lepro, Lepo Rahas Batberry, we both know you are gems. <laughs> You're the same person. Be honest, just admit it. You are the same. You're one and the same. Hundred <laughs> percent. You're one and the same. Hundred uh, percent. You are um, the same person because you have the same argument at the same time. Because you said in the live stream you missed one crucial uh, motive, and that in the chat that Leprobast Berry said exactly the same thing, but didn't know how to spell crucial. And then when you spoke with your poor English, you are the same person. <laughs> and now you're saying, "I had a good point." Yeah. To be honest, you're the same person. It's the only to act like you've got some kind of supporter in the chat. It's you. <laughs> oh. Honestly. Yeah, I know, Cookie Monster. I know. I don't mind. I think I think <laughs> Oh dear. I, I I think I think some people forget, right? Um <laughs> I think I think uh, some people forget that my whole platform is speakers corner, yeah, and uh, <laughs> uh, my whole platform is speakers corner, right? And speakers corner is a place where I roll up my sleeves and deal with whoever comes at me, right? So, do you think somebody in a chat is going to upset me? Uh, disorientate me. I, I don't know many people have thicker skin than I do. <laughs> oh, Allah Akbar. That's so funny. Do you know what I mean? I think people truly forget seriously how I built my reputation. And see me chilled out in my kameez in my room with a headphone on, and they think that it's not the same guy. It's the same guy. Yeah, 
and uh, just a sharp. And uh, <laughs> it's just like, you're not going to upset me by things you say to me because you know my my motto, do not react emotionally to the things that people say to you for then they'll know they can control you with their words. But when I'm speaking to these uh, Avery fans, I just want to know what they have saw, what they believe they witnessed. Yeah. What, what, what is it that they saw in that conversation that made them believe that Avery cooked me? I just intrigued. It's intrigue. Uh, it, it, it just intrigues me as to what you watched. Do you get me? It just intrigued me. Are, are you watching the same thing? What lenses are you watching through? What are you listening to? So, you know, whenever I see somebody who comes and thinks that I was cooked or I ran or I was this or I was that, I want to know. I want to hear it from you. And isn't it weird that every single one of you who've come into my chat over the past three days now, talking about being cooked, talking about being uh destroyed all of these things not one of you have come up and told me how take care sheldon not one of you has come up and said well here's what he said and here's how he substantiated his claim and here was your response which didn't respond to his claim not one of you not one of you has actually been brave enough to come on and talk about it. So don't think I'm upset or I'm triggered when you come into my chat and you start saying these things. It's intrigue. I want to know how you think. Are you really all Ryan's? Seriously, is 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 this is this is this some kind of Ryan flex? Yeah, is this condition of Ryanitis? I think we're going to call it Ryanitis. Yeah. So, <laughs> do you have the Ryanitis condition? Have you been infected with Ryanitis? It seems so. And what and and as you see now, Ryan got taken completely apart, like like flies off of, wings off a fly. Yeah, you think I'm going to start ooh drilling into you? I'm not going to drill into you, so you can relax. I'm just going. I just want to know what you saw, what you witnessed, how you understood it, how you comprehended what was being said. Yeah. I just want to know because I'm intrigued how anybody who watched that debate or discussion thought Avery demonstrated his point. Also, Hamza, there were Christians who know you, supporting you, even though on here they may come across as Christians debating you. I saw Pastor Jason telling Christians you got strong points. He's just fishing for a debate, but yes. Gaslighting me. Everyone's gaslighting me. But thank you, Jason Burns, in his absence. No, I wouldn't say with someone except Jesus they've been Ryanized. That's not quite that's not quite fair. Be getting Ryanitis is a condition. It's not just because you're a Christian. Not all Christians are right of have Ryanitis. Okay. It's the Christians who mouth off in the chat, come on, come talk complete gibberish and leave thinking they did something. This is Ryanitis. Yeah. So no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't tie all Christians with the same brush. Yeah, but if it's an argumentation or a discussion or a debate, and your boy clearly didn't demonstrate his point, be honest enough.
Seriously, that's, yeah, so it's not all Christians, yeah? We give everyone a chance, and then we'll diagnose whether it's Ryanitis or not. I think uh, King Supa and Sheikh White all have Ryanitis, to be honest. Now this, I, 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 I don't know how to take. Um, can someone deal with God logic? He's attack. He's attacked Islam left and right. We need someone strong. <laughs> it's poor argumentation, dude. But my advice, though, to be honest with you, is lay Muslims stay away from them both, Avery and Sam, because they'll do you on rhetoric alone. So just even if you're incorrect with the correct information, they'll do you in their debate tactics and skill, and isolating you. I was watching a Sam Shimon short today and I was just like, what is this? This, <laughs> I'll tell you the problem Christians have. I'll tell you the problems. And the Quran's already pointed out the problem they have. The Quran's already pointed out their problem. But they have this problem. And they don't just have it um, with, he, he didn't shaggy. He didn't win the debate about my knowledge about the Quran. It, it was understood. I'll explain the problem they have. So they seem incapable of distinguishing between explicit statements and ambiguous ones. And rather than listen to what's explicit, they would rather ignore the explicit and fish in the ambiguous. Now, Muslims, we deal with the explicit first. Or if we come across something ambiguous, something that we're not quite understanding, we can um, we can see is, is there any explicit verses with regards to the same matter? And if now the, here's 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 the problem uh, Avery had. So this is the response to you, Shaggy. So this is a, this is a problem Avery had. So Avery had a problem where he came across an ambiguous verse where Allah says in the Quran. Um, with regards to Surah Yusuf, that um, in this book everything is made clear with regards, whatever it regards. Now, there's two ways we can understand this. Okay. The first way we can understand it is as Avery tried to claim. It means that the Quran is saying every single verse of the Quran is easily explained. So you should know everything in the Quran because this verse says that. Or it could mean what I said, that it's referring to this is Allah telling you that everything that occurred with the prophets of the past with regards to the story of Yusuf can be found within the book as truth. OK, so this is an, another way it could be understood. So you've got two ways to understand the verse. First way that it's saying um, that this Quran is says every single verse is explained, or it's saying everything about the story of Yusuf has been recorded here, or everything that's been said about is is true here. Okay, so now we have an ambiguous statement: is this true or is this true? Now, what we do as Muslims, we look for explicit statements. Now, this is the mistake that Avery made. So we go to a verse in Surah Al Imran where Allah speaks specifically about the verses. So in this verse, in this in this part, in this uh, uh, ayat, Allah says, in this book, there are clear, easily understandable verses. And in this book, there are ambiguous verses. So Allah says clearly, talking about the verses in the book, this is explicit now, in some are clear and some are ambiguous. And the mischief makers will ignore the explicit verses and they will try to mess around with the ambiguous verses. Now, this is the problem. I'm going to tell you the problem Avery made. This is why his name, God Logic, doesn't apply. OK, what he did then was used. He insisted on rather than taking the explicit verse like I did, 
and well so i this is how i did it i read the explicit verse which says what some verses are clear some verses ambiguous i come across a verse that says allah has explained everything oh wait a minute you just said that okay and then i see ah you're referring to what you just spoke about that's fine then but what avery did he would say he would hold to his understanding rather than using the explicit verse he would actually <laughs> he would do it this way he would make his understanding he would make his understanding of the verse that came later as explicit and then what he would do he would then say this is a contradiction to the other explicit verse so he's acting like this is explicit and this is explicit therefore it's a contradiction but that wasn't the case one was explicit one was uh ambiguous and you don't then take the choose the option that makes a contradiction when you look at the context of everything and this is the problem Avery made. So rather than see something as ambiguous, he sees as explicit, yet he's saying that. And he admitted on screen, he knows Ibn Kathir disagrees with that. He knows all the Muslim scholars disagree with that. He knows no Muslim understands this verse as saying that. But he understands it that way. And because he understands it that way, he sees it as a contradiction with the verse which says some verses are clear and some verses are ambiguous, which is illogical, <laughs> which is just illogical. Hence, no logic. Okay. That's it. Now, how Christians think that was some kind of victory for him? I don't know. I really don't understand it. When you read it in context, you understand. Why do you think? Why do you think he has to go to the end of a surah? The last words of the surah and then say, yeah, you see? You know, have we got it to hand? Let's see if we got it to hand. All right. So let, let's read it together. So was it 7-11, was it? Bismillah. Was it 7? Was it 7? No, what was it? Surah Yusuf, wasn't it? What's Surah, what Surah Yusuf? I don't even know what Surah Yusuf is. Do, 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 do. Someone in the chat will tell me in a minute. Now, oh, there we go. Surah 12. Okay. Now, this is the this is the verse we read, yeah. In their stories, oh, let me let me uh, let's do it from uh, let's do it from. Uh, so this is from sort of one or two to give it real good context. That is from the stories of the unseen, which we reveal to you, O prophet. You were not present when they all made up their minds and when they plotted against Joseph. And most people will not believe no matter how keen you are. Even though you are not asking them for a reward for this Quran is only a reminder to the whole world. How many signs in the heavens and the earth do they pass by with indifference? And most of them do not believe in God without associating others with him in worship. Do they feel secure that an overwhelming torment from God will not overtake them or that the owl will not take them by surprise when they least expect it? Say, O prophet, this is my way I invite to God with insight. I am those who follow me. Glory be to God. And I am not one of the polythe polytheists. We only sent before you, O prophet, men inspired by us from among the people of each society. Have the deniers not traveled through the land to see what was the end of those destroyed before them? And surely the eternal home of the hereafter is far better for those mindful of God. Will you not then understand? And when the messengers despaired and their people thought the messengers had been denied help, our help came to them at last. We then saved whoever we willed and our punishment is never averted from the wicked people. In their stories, there is truly a lesson for people of reason. This message cannot be a fabrication, rather it is a confirmation of previous revelation, a detailed explanation of all things, a guide and a mercy for people of faith. A guide. Okay, so it's exactly what we said with regards to this, it's talking about this Quran, it talks about life, talks about death, talks about guidance, talks about previous messengers and previous revelations and previous miracles and previous books. This Quran is telling you this, that verse is not saying every verse in this book is, is, under, is explained. It's just not doing that. So you can see from the context, it's not doing that. We can see from the explicit verse where we already know Allah said, some verses are clear and some verses are amb ambiguous. And that verse came in Surah Al-3, Surah Al-Imran. So 
In verse three, we're told, yep, some verses you'll understand, some verses you won't. Alas, we accept that. But in this verse, to use it as an example, that's a contradiction, is illogical. Anyway, I hope that helps. Okay, one mistake I made, I called uh, chapters, I think I called uh, verses chapters or something. Yeah, well, we all have slip of the tongue sometime. What other point was it? Um, oh, yeah, the one about uh, the only Allah knows. So Allah knows the, the true meaning of, of these things. And of course, that would mean what? Messengers of God could be have the revelation by Allah of the understanding of these things. But at the same time, it's talking about some things like heaven and hell and paradise. Sorry, and, and, and things of the grave or whatever it may be that we cannot know for surety because we can't see these things. This is a matter of Iman. This is part of our belief. Do you understand? So Allah knows for certainty because he knows. But for us, we don't know. We, we, we're told what it is and we believe it. But we can't demonstrate it. We can't demonstrate the punishment of the grave, for example. Yeah, we can't demonstrate paradise. We can't demonstrate hellfire. Yeah, but we believe they exist and we believe these things will occur. That's it. So again, Avery fans, remind me what you think Avery did. That's it. That, that's that's all. I, that's all I want to know. One thing is sure he's afraid to defend Christianity with you as debater Hamza. He's in thirty minutes. So I'll have to go. But was still there after sixty minutes. Shows he's afraid. To... Look, we know how terrible he is at defending Christianity. We know how terrible he is. But he didn't mind trying to engage a weak Muslim in that kind of thing. But as soon as some knowledgeable one come on, that's it. He doesn't want to talk about that anymore. Do you know what I mean? But he, he was right. He did make the title um, of what he said about Jesus and Messiah and such. Therefore, um, he shouldn't have allowed the other Muslim to go there. If he's going to allow the other Muslim to go there, then he should allow me to go there. If he's not going to allow the whole me to go there, he shouldn't have allowed the other guy to go there. Anyway. All right, done of that now. I'm going to go build some fences. Uh, right. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, uh, my mods, uh, MA, Amberine, and Leith, keeping order because we know, like I say, uh, we do need to try to refrain from name calling. It's not our way, it's not our style. We don't do it that way. Uh, we don't need to mock in such a way. Don't get me wrong, we can point and laugh at those people who try to come and make claims that's different. But um, for the sake of someone being a Christian, we don't just mock. For the sake of someone just being an Avery fan, we don't just mock. We, we, we challenge what they say, and then we deal with that from that point. Do you get me? So have a wonderful day, everybody. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Here comes the lion. Time for those fences. <laughs>